Hey everybody, welcome back to our series in the book of Revelation. We are gonna do part three of the Church of Pergamum, and we're gonna look uh, at more things that we ha are gonna discover in the text. If you remember last time, we talked about how Pergamum th was thoroughly married to the state, and so we had a state church, and then through Pergamum, uh, the Babylonian uh, ideas and practices started infiltrating into the church. And we talked about that. So if you haven't watched part one and two of Pergamum, uh, go back and, and get that all under your belt so you understand what we're talking about. Because what happened was, and I think just to refresh our minds, um, if, I, if I remember, if I mentioned this, that the Babylonian priesthood was in Babylon. But Babylon was taken over by the Medes and Persia, Persians. And when Babylon was taken over, the Babylonian priests, uh, the, uh, those in charge of the mystery cults and things of, of that nature, all went to Turkey. And guess where they centered? They centered and settled in Pergamum. And so this church is centered right where the Babylonian uh, priests and practices and mystery cults all centered in on. And so in church history, this is the era when that Babylonianism infiltrated the church. And so a lot of what we talked about last time that you see in the Catholic church today comes directly from pagan um, Babylon and just the mystery cults of Babylon. And I, and I enumerated last time all the different facets of, of what it got introduced into the church. Um, music, uh, choirs, we talked about the, the, the pastors wearing different types of clothing, prayers for the saints, prayers to Mary, all this other stuff started infiltrating itself into the church, which a lot of it can be seen in, I would say, even uh, Orthodox Church and Catholic Church. Uh, you can see how the leaven has worked inside the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church to corrupt it, uh, because a lot of its practices stem straight from Babylon. And by the way, the Protestant church is not too far away from being thoroughly leavened as well. And a lot of the weird stuff that we see in the Protestant churches today also comes straight from Babylon. And so anyway, all three branches of Christianity, Orthodox, Catholic, and then Protestantism are, have all been thoroughly leavened. And the last remaining vestige of any remnant whatsoever is uh, in that Protestant uh, wing, but there's very few of that left because uh, now almost the entire loaf of Protestantism has been leavened. And like I've mentioned before, um, where I'm getting my idea of three branches comes straight from the mystery parables that Jesus gave in Matthew 13. And he said there was a woman who introduced leaven into three meals. Well, to understand that passage, the woman represents the whore of Babylon, okay? And she introduces leaven. Leaven is sin. Love and his false doctrine, love and his false practices, and she introduces it into three loaves. Uh, one loaf is Orthodox, one loaf is, the, is uh, Catholicism, and the third loaf is Protestantism, just exactly how the three branches played itself out in church history. Anyway, we're going to now pick up where we left off. And so what we're going to see right now in verse 16 is that Jesus is going to encourage them and exhort them to repent of all of this, um, to repent of this allowing Babylon uh, into the church, uh, allowing the state to control the church. Um, he's going to ask them to, to repent of this. It's worldliness, it's Babylonianism, or else they will face the disciplining hand of the Lord. So it says in verse 16, repent. And when it says repent, it's not talking about salvation, okay? It's talking to people in the church that have this spiritual issue, okay? That practice Babylonian things, that practice worldliness, that are married to the state. Now, even in Protestantism, Protestantism um, a church is independent of the state, but what we have seen in the last few years, many churches simply comply with the state. So they might as well be married to the state. They were told to shut down and the churches shut down. They were told to encourage uh, this or that program and they did. They encouraged them to take the experimental, I'll call it piercing, so I don't get kicked off of YouTube, uh, and churches did. I mean, 
So they might as well be part of the state. Many of the churches took money from the state to pay for their salaries, to pay for their, uh, their uh, staff, why they stayed shut down. I mean, you might as well be married to the state at that point. So Protestantism is not exempt from being married to the state. It just does it uh, de facto instead of de jure. But anyway, um, the believer is, is encouraged to overcome this spiritual issue. And, and this repentance means to change your mind concerning the path that you're on. That if you're on this path of, of Pergamum, right? Uh, Christ is, is now encouraging you to repent, okay? And when these believers are told to repent, again, it starts with a change of mind, but then it eventually results into some type of change, usually in actions of repentance that deal with some type of spiritual issue, okay? So they're, uh, what they are is to leave this church. If you're in a Pergamum type of church, you need to leave it. That's your faith in action, okay? You have to get out of it. And if you're part of the problem and have the Pergamum idea that these practices that come from Babylon are okay, like transcendental meditation, like yoga, like um, centering prayer, all these other things that people do, uh, if you're part of that, that's Babylonian. And so you are to repent of that and stop that and get out of that personally. And that's who Christ is talking to. And remember, this church was very worldly because the state and the church had married. And what we have talked about has, as um, some of the people in the church uh, were not even saved because again, they would just baptize you and that would make you a member of the church and of the state. And so the church became very worldly and the believers in that church gravitated to worldliness. And so um, that's one of the things that the believer has to repent of is being worldly. The Laodicean church is worldly. They too have the same problem. And, and here's the problem. In Western society, this has been a problem because of the affluence in Western society. It has caused many, many Christians to become worldly. And they think their affluence is a product of blessing. Many times they think that's a blessing of God or something like that. And then they basically go through the motions of worship each week, um, but their hearts are far from the Lord. Uh, in reality, many of these people worship themselves. They come to church to worship themselves. Not they don't they don't they're not there to worship God. That's what Pergamum does to people. It puts them as a zombie, a spiritual zombie. They're not there for the right reasons. They're worldly. Um, even in the Bible Belt, I, I've heard pastors say these people come to church so they can network together and get jobs and thing, things like that. Other people come to church to find a date and, and their motives are all messed up. They're not there to worship God. Other people come to church to cause problems. Uh, other people come to church to, to satisfy someone else that they want to get off their back. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons, but a lot of that is just simply worldly and they invade the worship and they're there. And, uh, and this is who Christ is telling, talking to is saying, hey, you've got you've to stop this or I'm gonna judge you. And it's hard, worldliness is very difficult, especially living in Western society. Um, because a lot of times in, in our society in our social structures in society, we're defined by these, these traits of worldliness, affluence, and what we have, and where we're going, and this and that, you know, the latest fashions or whatever. And so we got to be careful to not let this world define us as such and make us into its mold. And then what happens is once you get uh, molded into the worldly image and you become worldly, a worldly Christian, uh, you'll, you'll live a life of hypocrisy. Um, you'll criticize others. You get jealousy. Uh, bitterness and envy because of other what other people have. You become preoccupied with the details of life rather than eternal treasures is the idea. You know, you're not storing up treasure in heaven, you're storing up treasure on earth. Um, and again, there's just a lot of that. But the churches in Western society are basically peddling a Madison Avenue type of mentality. 
uh, and that goes under the name of evangelism or church growth or you know God's blessing, whatever it is. We see that in the health and wealth prosperity gospel type thing, but it's invaded most of America anyway, even if the church is not health and wealth. There's a lot of worldliness in the church. You can tell by the way people dress. You can tell by the way that um, they, they do their entertainment. Remember we talked about last time that it's worshiptainment, not, not worshiping the Lord. People sit back and watch a concert in front of them. The pastor is a motivational speaker. That's worldly. He's not exegeting the scriptures, giving application, giving principle, anything like that. That's, that's the kind of churches that we have, even in Protestantism. The, many of the churches in Protestantism are as dead as a doornail as the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church. They're just dead. And because they are worldly. And again, you got to be very, very careful because worldliness is like a cancer. So if the, the leadership of the church is worldly, it'll, get, it'll saturate itself and spread like a cancer into the congregation. And the congregation will think, well, this is being spiritual. And it's actually not. Because worldliness will eventually change your values. It'll change your core beliefs. Uh, it'll change your priorities, and it will it, it will definitely change your pursuits. And that's the, the danger of worldliness. That's the danger of what happened in Pergamum. This passage, it refers to somebody in the, in the, in the Pergamum church in 95 AD named Antipas. And you think that he was not like this. And his name means against all. Antipas means against all. And what was he against all of? He was against all of paganism. He was against worldliness. He refused to compromise. And, and of course, uh, that's what the Lord's trying to admonish his, his people to be like, is to be against all of this paganism, be against this world system, right? And, and so there was clearly people who would overcome this issue, and that's the issue you and I have to overcome as well. And if we have, then great. We need to admonish more people to overcome this. So the disciplining hand of the Lord says this, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, the sword is the romphea in Greek. Um, and obviously, this has to do with judgment coming from the words of the Messiah. And so the sword here symbolically represents a twofold ability of the word of God, um, basically to separate believers from the world while at the same time condemning the world for, it, for its sin. A romphea is a major heavy sword. It's not a dagger. It's a major, major heavy sword. And it would be used for cleaving, used for dividing things. Um, it can be used as a sort of salvation or sort of deliverance, but in, in this context, it is a sort of death that he will separate the two out if you don't overcome this. And so this cleaving of judgment would fall upon the church of Pergamum, Pergamos because they had neglected the word of God. It wasn't central to their lives. It wasn't it didn't mean anything in their lives, in deed, in doctrine. And basically, because of that, it made them vulnerable to infiltration of the world. And as a result, that's what happened with the Church of Pergamum and with the era of Pergamum. You know, the, uh, this mixed marriage took place, which was, which should never have happened. The marriage between the state and the church, they needed to stop that, and they didn't. And so this church still exists today. The era that we're in is Laodicea, but Pergamum still exists, and they are the compromised church. They are the ones thoroughly married to not only the state, but they're thoroughly married to the Babylonian system, and they practice that in their services. And anyway, in our modern day and time, in, in a personal application of this, we have to overcome this, and then we have to speak the truth in love when we see it. And I know a lot of times, you know, people say, well, I don't want to offend anybody. Um, you know, uh, I desire to fit in. I don't want to stand out by calling it out in my church. Uh, or I don't, I don't want to offend my family member because they go to a church that's Pergamum um, or whatever. We've got to get over that. 
We've got to warn them that, hey, man, you're in a Pergamum church. It's a worldly church. It's a Babylonian church. And we got to, we got to rescue them with the truth. Help them to find a good, healthy church and to personally overcome it. I mean, it's one thing if we are worldly. We have to repent of that. But it's another thing if we see it in the lives of other people and our family and our friends that are just simply worldly. They go to a church that, that makes them worldly, that pushes worldliness. And then we've got to confront that. We've got to talk to them. And basically out of this, Jesus says, if you repent of this and overcome this, he's going to give you two rewards. And these are to believers. Um, he's going to give hidden manna. And he's going to give a white stone to those who refrain or cut themselves off from intermarrying with the world or the state. Okay? So in verse 17, it says this, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Um, again, Messiah is appealing to all individuals in this condition, requesting that they change spiritually that it needs to start with the individual. If you have an ear to hear, then hear what I'm saying, okay? And he's basically, he, he gave a negative because I'll, I'll judge you. And then he gives a positive, I'll reward you. Now the judging of the believer that doesn't overcome this means that they lose rewards, okay? That's what it means in a negative sense. It's not judgment in an eternal sense, it's judgment with a loss of rewards. But then in the positive sense to the believer, to him who overcomes, or basically has victory, it's where we get the word Nike, Nike from the Greek, he who has victory, he who overcomes, he says, I will give him some of the hidden manna to eat. And that's a reward. It's not a gift. It's a reward. A gift is given to you freely like salvation. But you earn a reward. A gift isn't earned. And that's why rewards are very different. And you have to distinguish rewards between salvation. Salvation is not a reward. Salvation is a gift. Rewards are gift to believers for overcoming certain things like this. Okay. What does it mean by giving you some of the hidden manna that Messiah promises? Um, well, this is the manna that was in the ark that was preserved, right? Moses had put Aaron's staff in there. He had put the manna and the Ten Commandments in the Ark of the Covenant. So those are the three items in there. So you know what manna is. God fed them in the desert, in the wilderness, um, with manna and water as well. But uh, they took some of that manna as, to commemorate what God did, and they put that manna in the Ark of the Covenant. And that's what's called the hidden manna. It was the life-enhancing food uh, during that period of time. And so... Uh, all the nutrients, all the minerals, every, all the vitamins, everything that Israel could possibly want was in that manna to preserve them, what, for 40 years, right? So there's all, all they needed was that, okay? And so this hidden manna, obviously, gives the believer some type of increased experience of abundant life in eternity, in the messianic age and then into eternity because rewards are eternal rewards go beyond the messianic age and into eternity so people who overcome this who separate themselves from the world who separate themselves from the state and babylon get to partake of the hidden manna and again manna stood for god's what provision remember he was providing it and he was faithful to provide it he sustained his people right all that other stuff that they had in egypt they didn't need it all they needed was god's provision and so remember how they always wanted to go back to egypt and they they complained to moses uh, there was leeks and onions and melons and garlic and uh they yearned for the days of egypt remember that what that is, is a yearning for the world, the world system. It's a, Egypt, remember, as a typology, is a picture of the world. They wanted to go back to the world. That's why they complained. And, uh, but, uh, but so they, remember, they got, they got fed up with manna. It wasn't enough, and they wanted meat. And it just um, became a problem for those who were worldly. Now, if you weren't worldly, the manna was fine, and it satisfied you, and you were content. But those who were still worldly in Israel wanted to go back to Egypt. 
And that's the kind of the dynamic that's playing out here with the hidden manna. If you overcome this, you will be satisfied with the hidden manna that I provide, not only in this life, God's provision, but the reward of this manna in the next, which will give a life enhancing experience to the believer. And only these believers will have that experience. So yes, it's true. There are degrees of rewards, not only in heaven, but in the messianic kingdom. And these rewards are eternal. And so the idea here is some Christians will experience, some believers will experience a, a more reward and fulfilling experience in the messianic kingdom and in eternity than other people. Some Christians will be uh, least in the kingdom of God and some will be considered um, important in the kingdom of God or have authority in the kingdom of God or great in the kingdom of God. That's that having to do with ideas of authority. And, and so some people will have that authority for all eternity and some people won't have any authority because that's the nature of rewards. Furthermore, remember, Jesus called himself the food from heaven, right? Um, and so we have it literally being the manna that was put in the Ark of the Covenant, but the food from heaven obviously is the Messiah. He's ultimately, uh, in another sense, the hidden manna, okay? He comes down from heaven and uh, remember he said, I'm the bread of life. I'm the food that comes down from heaven. I'm the bread that comes down from heaven and gives eternal life, right? And he goes, remember he told them this, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died, right? And so um, while the manna could physically sustain them during the, the wanderers in the desert, the manna is a picture of Messiah that would come and give everlasting life and the abundant life as well. Remember one time the disciples uh, asked them, you know, where did you get food? Um, and Jesus said, I have food that you do not know of. And that food was the word of God. So the principle of the manna is a unique experience. The manna is divinely produced, right? But is humbly gathered. In order to receive the manna every day, they had to go out, if you recall, and get on their knees and pick it one handful at a time, okay? Every morning, they had to get up bright and early and do this act. And they had to do it every day. They couldn't store it. Why? Because every day when they got on their knees and was picking that manna up, it, it was a symbol of humility to get on their knees and it was a symbol of they had the responsibility to get up every morning and God would provide, but they would be responsible in gathering it hand by hand. And so he was teaching them humility and that humility brings provision. That's the idea. Pride is resisted by God and does not bring his provision. If someone thinks I made it, I'm a, I'm a self-made man, and I, I have all the money in the world, you're not gonna be provided for by God because you're haughty, because you're prideful. That's the idea here, and you won't overcome this issue. But those who are humble and are hungry get out in the morning and get on their knees and gather that manna hand by hand, and it represents those who are spiritually hungry, okay? That's what the idea is, that you overcome this through humility and becoming spiritually hungry for God, not for the things of the world. So it's a spiritual appetite. Furthermore, in this context, overcoming, the promise of overcoming and the, and the admonition of overcoming um, it is a reference back to eating the thing sacrificed to idols and to remain sexually pure, basically avoid fornication and kind of uh, be distinct from this world, right? So, in order to break away, you must also replace it. So not, it's not just a matter of getting rid of something, you gotta replace it, and what do you replace it with? You give up the appetite for the world and you create an appetite for Christ. And this is this sanctification part uh, of active faith, living faith, uh, in the living word and feeding on the things of Christ, right? Feeding on the word of God is the idea. 
And as you feed, it creates the appetite for it. And that allows you to overcome and, and give up the world, but then get your provision from God. You feed off of God rather than from the world. And again, these are all metaphors, right? But you understand where Christ is going about the manna. You have to feed off of God rather than this world system is the idea. And once you have that spiritual appetite, then it's really, it, it becomes fairly easy to let go of the things of the world because it, you know, it's like losing your appetite for sugar uh, or losing your appetite for some type of food or whatever it might be. And you're like, well, that doesn't even appeal to me anymore. There, and, and that's the idea. The world stops appealing to you once you feed off the word of God. You have to be humble to get the manna, right? You, you approach it with humility and humility means that you, you recognize your spiritual poverty and that to get proper nutrition, you have to go to the Lord. The world can't give you proper nutrition. And so once you start eating those kinds of foods and staying off of this other junk food from the world, your appetite changes, your appetite develops differently. And we've all seen that as adults. Has your appetite changed for different foods and foods you don't like? That's the idea, is you don't have an appetite anymore like that. I mean, when I was a kid, I had an appetite for junk food. There's no doubt about it, man. As a kid, I loved candy and all that stuff. Now, I can hardly eat that stuff because it makes me sick. And it's not because I'm, I'm, I've sworn myself off of sugar, my appetite has changed. And so I'm not, I'm no longer looking for really sweet stuff anymore. Um, and so it's weird, you know, you get older and your appetite changes. That's what God is trying to say is change your appetite. And you can do so if you feed on the right foods and leave the other stuff away. Now let's talk about the white stone. He says, I will give to him a white stone. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's two things uh, it could be. Um, in that day, uh, if someone was found innocent in a trial, uh, they would give him a white stone. And that white stone was a symbol of acquittal, okay? They were acquitted of guilt and um, they were back in society, okay, as a regular person. Um, but I don't know if that really is the context here because he's speaking to believers rather than unbelievers in this context. And we're not talking about salvation, we're talking about rewards in this sense. So if we're talking about rewards, a better fit for this idea of the white stone comes from the ancient world as well, and comes from the idea that when someone was a member of a private club in the ancient world, they would, um, they would give white stones out, and that's how you would be invited to a private feast uh, and that white stone was a symbol of acceptance. It was white because it was pure, it was uh, you know, unstained from the compromise, so to speak. So the white stone meant you're part of the club now. Well, what does this mean spiritually? Well, in context, it means that you will be part of a club that gets this reward. And this reward is given to those select members of the body of Christ who overcome worldliness. If you overcome worldliness, you get to be part of so-called the club. And so this is where rank, authority, proximity to the throne all happens here. You'll be part of another type of group, a, a more elite group that overcame this versus someone that didn't. And that's what I think uh, contextually the white stone refers to. So for instance, like in John's day, these people would be given the special stones and it would entitle the person who had this stone to a kind of special fraternity, a special hospitality, special friendship, all that was entailed. And so that's where this reward is going, that they get some type of special treatment beyond other believers in the Messianic kingdom and in eternity. And this new name that he refers to you get a white stone with a new name. Um, this, is, this is reminiscent of any person in the Old Testament, as you recall, and the New Testament, I will say. Um, you get a new name when you overcome certain spiritual problems. And that's, that's true in the Old Testament and true in the New Testament. And so, if you recall, Jacob's name went to Israel, right? 
Abram's name went to Abraham, right? And so the idea um, is that you get a, a, a new stone, you're part of this club, this elite club, so to speak, and you get a new name because um, you overcame this particular issue. And you're going to be given a new name, which no one knows. It's the, the name is a private name between you and the Lord, okay? Because he says, except him who receives it. So it demonstrates that something of your character, something that you did to overcome this issue, and, and, and that stone gives you a new responsibility, a new authority, something, something like that in the kingdom and eternity. Now, why I, I can't be so definite? Because it doesn't allow me to be definite. I'm just taking what it says and just piecing some of the puzzles together. But we still don't got a we don't have a full orb perspective of what this all entails because it's the language of heaven, and in that case, it's the currency of heaven. And a lot of us don't understand that, and I don't understand it myself. But apparently, it's important. You're going to want a new stone in heaven. You're going to want to be an overcomer in heaven. You're going to want all these rewards is the idea. So you have to have faith in these types of rewards. That's why they're not spelled out in detail because he wants you to just take it by faith that what I'm telling you're going to be rewarded with is the currency of heaven. And it's going to be extremely important to have these things when you're there. So that's taken by faith, right? And if you recall, even in the New Testament, Jesus changed Peter's name, right? He was unstable Simon, impetuous, jumping in headfirst, right? To become Peter, the little rock. In that same vein, if you and I overcome this, you're going to get that new name, which is, in, which is going to show that God has accomplished something in and through your life, in your walk, and you became a Nike believer, an overcomer in this, in this situation. Now, remember, this is a name between you and the Messiah. Ray Steadman one time gave a great illustration of this. And Ray Steadman used to be at Peninsula Bible Church uh, in Northern California. And believe it or not, he had Elizabeth Elliot uh, at his church, the wife of martyred missionary Jim Elliot, right? Remember Jim Elliot was killed in Ecuador? Well, in her book, she refers to herself as Betty, okay? So while visiting the church, Ray Steadman called her Betty, okay? He didn't think anything of it. So after a while, she took Ray to, uh, by the side and asked him to call her Elizabeth. Because why? Because Betty was Jim's private name for her. It was a special mark of intimacy. She cherished the name and wanted to preserve its special value. And that's the kind of the idea of this new name that Messiah gives you. It's between you and him. It is an intimate name that only you and him share because he knows what you went through to overcome. And, and that new name will signify that you have overcome. So we're being tempted to compromise with this world system, tempted to compromise with the religious world system, the whore of Babylon. We're being tempted to uh, compromise with the state. Currently, right now, that's what's happening. And, and that temptation is only met by a connection to Jesus, who gives us the spiritual food, the manna we need to sustain us. And that's really what the connection we're looking for. We're not looking for any other connection. It's really found in Jesus. And once you have that connection with Jesus, and, and we're not talking about salvation, that's a given we're talking about. We're talking to believers, okay? So since we're talking to believers, we're not talking about salvation. We're talking about how do you maintain your fellowship with the Lord in all of this compromise? Well, again, you feed off of him. You feed off of his word. You get your nourishment from his word, right? And if you do, and that food comes into you and you metabolize it, you become immovable. You won't compromise. You won't give in. You will never give in because you're not tempted by the junk food. You get your meat and potatoes, so to speak, from the Lord, and that's all you need. And once you feed upon that and you have a, a steady diet of what the Lord gives you, you be, this, this, this is a, a, an area you can overcome. 
You'll be like Antipas, right? You'll be against all of the world offers, right? You'll be against everything that this world tries to tempt you with. Because it's all satanic, as you know. And so we have to have, wear that moniker, Antipas, against all of this system. But feeding on the Lord is the key to overcome Pergamum. Okay, with that being said, uh, the next church we're going to study is Thyatira, okay? So we move from the compromised church uh, that was thoroughly married to the state, and we're going to go full bore into looking at Roman Catholicism with Thyatira. That's the era of the Roman Catholic Church, and that's what Pergamum led itself into, okay? And we'll look at the historical development next time. So, uh, again, check out YouTube, Rumble, uh, uh, Pit Shoot. And we'll have these videos on the Book of Revelation constantly uploaded as I have enough time to do them. And we're going to eventually have the whole Book of Revelation on video. So that's our goal. So it might take a while, but we're going to try to try to get it accomplished. Okay. So God bless you. Thanks for studying. And we'll see you next time.